I think we can start. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Nedim Ahmed. I'm the Deputy Director at the Centre for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities here at the OECD. I, I'm delighted to, to see so many of you here today and uh, at this event, organised with our excellent partners at the Regional Studies Association. And I wanted to begin by thanking them first for their excellent cooperation, in, not just in organising this event, but in, in general. They're great partners. I, I also want to say a big thank you to our excellent speakers, Ilaria Mariotti, um, Arjun Ramani, and Louisa Kempton for joining us today to provide insights on today's topic, remote working and impact on territorial inequalities. Now, I don't think I have to say too much by way of motivation for the choice of topic. This has been a hot topic for at least uh, the last two years now, and, uh, and our speakers will speak far more eloquently than I will on this topic. Uh, but that being said, um, this, despite the growing body of evidence on the subject, and we'll hear much more about this um, during today's event, uh, there remains perhaps considerable uncertainty on the long-lasting effects of the pandemic. And you know, we know that remote working is in one form or another almost certainly here to stay, but where the impacts we felt most, rural areas, large cities, intermediate cities, peripheral areas, is still to some extent an open question, at least at a global level. Uh, but we can already begin to start thinking about the potential impacts, you know, looking at various scenarios and how, you know, what, what those impacts might have across different areas, such as housing, commuting patterns, transport infrastructure, services provision. And, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing much more from our speakers on all of these issues. But before I begin, I've been asked to say a few housekeeping rules and announcements. And I know that many of you are very familiar with all of these housekeeping rules. So I feel a bit like a, a flight steward you know, asking you to prepare yourself for the safety information, but I have to do this anyway. Um, I mean, the first point that I wanted to make is more of an announcement. And the, the announcement is that the Regions in Recovery is the second global e-festival organized by the RSA, um, together with a number of partners. And this is the second early career plenary panel. The event runs until this Friday, the 1st of April, and non-presenting delegates can still register for free on the RSA website. Perhaps on a point of housekeeping now, then please keep muted at all times, unless you're called to speak. Um, the meeting will be recorded and made available on the RSA hub after the event. If you wish to stay private, then please keep your video turned off and don't unmute yourself to ask a question. Um, to ask questions, please put them in the chat using a queue in front of it. Uh, you can also use the raise hand function and wait to be called by me, then unmute and ask the question. So with all of that, um, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, my colleague, Andres Sanabria, who's going to set the scene by presenting some of our own work today, looking at today's topic, a study we launched back in June, um, looking at the implications of um, remote working um, adoption on place-based policies uh, with a, a special focus on G7 countries. And this is very much in keeping with the, the forward-looking future-proofing drivers that, that I mentioned a few, a few seconds ago. Um, now, Andres is a, a policy analysis in our center, the, the, the CFE, and he's conducted um, economic and policy analysis for urban and rural studies across OECD countries. He recently co-authored the new OECD framework on rural development, and indeed, he co-authored the report presenting today. He holds a master's degree in public affairs in the LSE and science po. So Andres, over to you, you have five minutes. Yeah, thank you Nadim, thank you for the introduction. And as you mentioned, uh, I will share a, a short overview of some of the OECD findings uh, regarding the effect of uh, remote working on regional development. Uh, this information gathers different studies that we have done in the house, so you will find the sources of the reviews of the of the, of the reports in the in the slides that we will share afterwards. But the the first thing to say is that that uh, the pandemic came in the middle of pre-existing regional inequalities. Uh, the two thousand eight crisis reverted a, a special convergence trend that we that we had uh, before, and and accelerated the transition to service economy. So. Uh, See, after this crisis, the the gap, the income gap between metropolitan regions and and rural regions opened up, especially uh, those remote regions and and rural regions close to to small cities. That is true, as you see, for the OECD average, but also in the right for a, a number of of OECD countries. Um, when the pandemic arrived, well, this came with a great adoption of remote working uh, that we already know, and some countries even uh, uh, attaining like a 
shares of the remote working more than 60% of the population. But this trend was not uh, equally distributed across regions. Uh, so we see that uh, those regions, uh, mostly capital regions that which the economic structure was more towards service economy and, and, and had a, a, a development in digitalization and a step a bit further, they benefit the most. Uh, and also we saw that this trend uh, uh, brought some opportunities and treats for different dimensions across the um, different actors. So we see that for people, we have some opportunities, uh, especially work-life balance, for firms, uh, reduction of absenteeism, for places that is the focus of today's meeting, and for society, mainly um, environmental opportunities. But also we have treats with some of, the, of those. I think the, the, the important part of, of this is that today we, we saw that the, this experiment, this working from home uh, passed the test, especially the, the hybrid the model the form. Uh, many surveys have uh, indeed showed that uh, workers and employers both saw the benefits of working at home. Uh, two, two, three days uh, benefits on, on, on well-being in, and life balance and also uh, retention of, of employees. Also flexibility is the new standard. So we see workers wanting to change uh, uh, also location. But there is uh, still some uh, resistance uh, from some companies to fully adopt the remote working, especially the part of uncertainties on innovation, team building, uh, from the side of workers, uh, networking, uh, they are still there. And, and also there are some clear and clear interactions of, of uh, the effects that remote workers, especially those so-called nomad workers, uh, have in rural economies, you know, in the sustain, sustainable development of those economies. Someone are calling more for probably attracting or focusing on attracting families instead of these nomad workers. And, and there are persistent structural gaps, we, we can say, to, to allow different regions uh, to benefit from, from this trend. Uh, particularly here, I show the, 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 the gap on the access to broadband and access to especially speed broadband. Um, fast broadband and there are also gaps on, on services uh, especially uh, basic services access to education health in some rural regions to really attract uh, uh, these new workers by the cd and our message is well the, that the, the jury is still out on on defining what is the lasting impact on of remote working on 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 regional inequalities uh, we developed five scenarios on the impact of this new trend on settlement patterns. Uh, we have to say that these scenarios are not mutually exclusive. They can, they can occur uh, at the same time within a country. And now recent trends have uh, shown us that probably some three of these scenarios are most likely to happen or to be happening in, in countries. Uh, the renewable of cities, that cities becoming more uh, um, uh, attractive with the uh, greener and uh, with uh, greater well-being uh, for workers. The donut effect that our that the speakers of this of this meeting will will talk later. That people going to suburbs, suburbs, and the rise of intermediate cities. But uh, I think the the big message at the end is that regardless of the of the scenario, uh, policies have to be forward looking, um, at least to cover three main areas, uh, uh, reducing the gap to adopt teleworking in terms of digital access, but also regulation, uh, also providing the services for, for these uh, uh, rural regions to be attractive. And, and, and third, um, reduce the, the, probably the negative impact that remote working could have in environment, for example, when, when we talk about decentralized uh, use of energy. I think with that, uh, I will leave the floor to, to, the, to the next the speakers and thank you Nadine. Thank, thank you Andres and so you mentioned already the jury is still out and I think that we have like two to three members of the jury at least with us today so we're going to hear from them in terms of whether or not they, they have come to a, a view yet or whether or not they're, they're still out and thinking about it. So, so I'll, I'll begin by calling our first speaker Ilaria Mariotti and Ilaria is a, an associate professor of urban and regional economics at DASTU uh, Politecnico di Milano 
She achieved an MSc in Regional Studies at the University of Reading, a PhD in Economic Geography at the University of Groningen, and a PhD in Transport Economics at the Universita degli Studi di Geneva. Genova, sorry. She's also a member of the Urban Planning, Design and Policy PhD program at Politecnico di Milano. So, Ilaria, over to you for your 10 minutes. And, uh... Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Nadim, and thank you to all for having invited me. Uh, okay, so uh, I will. Um, as uh, yeah, Nadine said, yes, I'm an urban and regional economist, and uh, I'm uh, also I also got a grant uh, a scheme um, um, by the um, RSI on uh, the growth about the growth of remote work during the COVID-19 pandemic. I will uh, tell you briefly. Uh, I will explain you briefly about the geography of new working spaces and the on the periphery, and I'm also partner of the Coral ITN Marie Curie about a, a similar topic, so collaborative spaces in peripheral areas. Um, as we, uh, as a, a Eurofund uh, stated in uh, last year, um, uh, one fifth of European employees will continue teleworking. Okay, so what I was saying is that, yes, as also uh, Arion was saying about the fact that uh, companies are also changing their business model to invest in more flexible and hybrid spaces. And uh, uh, nowadays we uh, uh, experience that the work is uh, going closer to the workers and not the other way around as it, was, uh, it has always been. Then there is a renewed interest for new working spaces, third places of work that are beco becoming more and more a hybrid, that also uh, host remote workers in order to reduce commuting, improve work-life balance with positive effects on the sustainability in uh, most of the cases. And then uh, collaborative spaces uh, uh, can also, uh, especially if they are located in peripheral and in area, can also be seen as innovation catalysts. Uh, suburban and peripheral areas are attracting remote workers also because there is the new, this new trend of multi-locality, so uh, work in uh, different uh, places. And then within the city themselves, especially, especially large cities, there is uh, this new, uh, uh, let's say, strategy about the X-minute city, 15-minute cities in order to uh, foster near working. Okay, so I uh, will uh, uh, just uh, um, present you the main result of this uh, uh, RSA, uh, the research coming from uh, uh, this RSA uh, grant uh, about COVID, uh, where we uh, uh, focus on the Lombardy region. And we also uh, found a donut effect, as Arjun was explaining. And uh, uh, the idea here is uh, to uh, whether is, is not e uh, is not easy to test the uh, uh, two hypotheses. So one is uh, one framed by Philip McCann, uh, saying that uh, um, most proper the, the interland of most proper cities during the COVID nineteen pandemic has increased has enlarged very much. And this uh, should have a sort of a shadow effect on weaker cities. Therefore, cities that uh, are more economically weaker will become more vulnerable. And uh, we, I cannot test this uh, hypothesis now, but uh, it, uh, this should be uh, something to be done in the next future, not whether the not done at the fact, effect can have this kind of, uh, of impact. And then there is uh, the other hypothesis about the renew, uh, renewed role of suburban and peripheral areas for remote uh, working and whether and how this will reduce uh, territorial inequalities. And within this context, what, what, which is the role of new working spaces, uh, because as I said, I'm involved in two European projects, the cross section and the, the Coral IT and Marie Curie. Uh, mainly focusing on the role of new working spaces and uh, the policy, uh, new working spaces uh, as innovation catalysts for uh, peripheral and inner areas. So uh, this is the analysis we have run for the project of the RSI grant about the Lombardy region where Milan is the capital city. We uh, uh, checked the uh, presence of people in the region, in the municipalities of the region uh, uh, during the pandemic compared to uh, before what happened before the pandemic. And we used team mobile data 
This is a map about Milan, the city of Milan, where you can see, in, you can see indeed a, a, a kind of exit from the central neighborhoods from 63% to 47%. Um, while uh, the uh, neighborhoods, the more peripheral neighborhoods of, of the city, uh, um, uh, 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 were kind of kind of more attractive. So people living in these uh, more peripheral uh, neighborhoods were also working there, while the central area uh, lost uh, most of the city users and the peasants. Uh, this uh, this graph uh, says the same. So we have the blue line where we can see the, uh, the presence of uh, uh, people in the city of, of Milan entering the city after six o'clock in the morning, having a peak uh, at noon and then going back. If we look at the uh, orange line, uh, this is uh, the, uh, the line about the presence during the lockdown phase. So people entering the city were just those that were not uh, working remotely and were not uh, uh, specialized in uh, knowledge uh, services, so were people that had to be present at the, in, the, in the office, in the premises, in the hospital or whatever. So they were entering the city and uh, they were uh, uh, working in Milan and then going out. Uh, during the pandemic, and these data are about, uh, or, or, are about October 2020, and we are uh, updating now this data, uh, you see that the, the city be, uh, was more less attractive than before the pandemic. This map shows the donut effect in a way. So we see that Milan, as we saw before, the, the municipality lost uh, um, lost users, I mean, lost uh, presences, while the uh, municipalities in the uh, first ring uh, uh, um, became more attractive. We made, uh, therefore, a descriptive statistics and econometric analysis where we could see on, the, on this, in this graph, you can see the correlation between the knowledge workers, so the presence of knowledge workers in the municipalities outside Milan, and the uh, uh, number of uh, people that were previously commuting to uh, Milan uh, that during the pandemic uh, keep on staying in their uh, municipalities. So we can see that we can proxy that these people are mainly knowledge workers and therefore the main determinants of uh, the municipalities outside Milan, uh, uh, determinants of, the, of their attractiveness during the uh, pandemic concern the geographical proximity to the city of Milan and also the accessibility, the strong broadband connection, a high concentration of knowledge workers, but also of foreign immigrants. Um, uh, then, um, if we think about the location of uh, new working spaces and specifically co-working spaces, this is a map about their location in the uh, region of, uh, in the in Lombardy region. Uh, it's also true that what we are uh, experiencing is that during the pandemic, there has been a higher demand for these spaces in less central areas, so peripheral areas, and also partially remote areas, because there is the idea that is also supported by the, the public, the, 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 the policies, that um, uh, collaborative spaces in rural areas can act as enables of social innovation and as platforms for knowledge exchange. Uh, so to conclude is uh, uh, this idea about, uh, uh, so, so from one side, the uh, uh, interland of a more prosperous city can become uh, uh, larger and this can have a negative effect on the medium-sized cities that will lose uh, people and workers. But on the other side, there is this renewed interest of new working spaces in uh, less central areas, peripheral and sometimes also remote and mountain areas. Why? Uh, because thanks to uh, 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 remote working, digital nomads are more and more present. There are also uh, countries uh, helping them uh, uh, reducing their taxes and so on and so forth. And there are also some policy tools as are because uh, Papa uh, Giorgio uh, very well uh, explained in our paper, there are also policy tools under uh, um, enhancing and promoting directly and indirectly these new working spaces, and these uh, uh, policies uh, operate under the spectrum of creative industry, entrepreneurial growth, but also urban regeneration, 
reduction of community brain drain, so the fact of re to reduce brain drain, to attract youth employment and, and training, and also innovation tool for public uh, sector uh, reform. Uh, I, I conclude saying that, that there are also uh, researchers studying the relationship between the center and the periphery. And this is very much related to the issue of multilocality and to also the issue of uh, uh, specific uh, uh, typologies of, uh, of workers that are creative, that are uh, uh, talent uh, co-workers. Uh, uh, and uh, as uh, Arion said, we should really investigate whether talent is a competitive advantage also for these people to uh, be able not to be free of uh, 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 selecting the place where they want to live and work. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, sorry that for that. Was, uh, not at all. It was excellent. Thank before. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I can introduce uh, our second speaker, Arjun Ramani. Um, now, Arjun is the Economist's Global Business and Economics Correspondent, and before that, he worked on an emerging markets trading desk at Citadel. He's also a researcher at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and his work on the donut effects of COVID-19 on America's largest cities has been covered by Bloomberg, The Washington Post, and indeed The Economist, amongst many other papers. He graduated with honours from Stanford University, where he studied economics and computer science, and was a Kennedy Prize winner for best undergraduate thesis. And so what I suggest perhaps is that we, we take you Arjun now, and Ilaria, we, we can come back to you after Arjun, hopefully by then um, your bandwidth problem would have been improved. We'll keep our fingers crossed. So Arjun, over to you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Nadim. Is, is this coming clearly? Very clearly, thank you. Perfect. Cool, so I think uh, Ilaria was gonna present some results that align well with uh, you know what I'm going to show you so hopefully it acts as a, a good a good preview thanks so much for for inviting me here looking forward to your comments and, and the discussion so this is joint work that I'll be presenting with uh, Nick Bloom um, at Stanford um, it's a project that we started at the very beginning of the pandemic um, actually my older sister um, she she works in Manhattan uh, right in the in the heart of the city she came home, we, we, uh, we, we both went home during the pandemic to our parents' house in um, Indiana in the Midwest. So, you know, much less populated, much cheaper part of the country. And she was like, I'm just as productive, uh, you know, working from home as I, as I am in my apartment. When I move back, I'm not gonna move to Manhattan. I'm gonna move, uh, you know, several hours, you know, an hour north perhaps, cause I only, you know, I, I probably will only go to work maybe one day a week, given how well this is going. And so, you know, I was talking to Nick and you're we like, okay, let's test this. And I think that's an experience that probably resonates well with a lot of the people here. We're doing this meeting over Zoom. We've kind of observed that our productivity during, uh, you know, COVID uh, with remote is surprisingly higher than before. And I think that's kind of a key point. We've kind of stumbled upon, um, you know, perhaps a new equilibrium that maybe before businesses were too risk averse uh, to, 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 you know, Try, try this experiment out. We were forced to do so. We learned that it was uh, you know, more productive than we expected. Maybe you can model this with some kind of multi-arm bandit or some other kind of you know, situation where you're making decisions under uncertainty. And now we could be settling into a new equilibrium. And that's what we're gonna suggest with this paper. Um, so first of all, what's the donut? So the donut is you know, illustrated most clearly with uh, this, this, this set of uh, figures. Um, we're seeing the two uh, you know, what most people would consider the two most agglomerated metropolitan statistical areas, metro areas in America, New York, and the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and so you can basically see the, the central business district, which is, you know, the, the, the point at which there's the, the most concentration of economic activity, saw net outflows of population, and the surrounding areas saw net inflows. So basically, we're taking this to suggest that both people moved out of city centers and less people moved in. And actually it turns out there's other research showing it's, it's more about less people moving in than people moving out necessarily, but you know, both, both matter to the story. Um, and so the, the, this donut basically is something, uh, you know, I'm gonna show in later slides, is something that we found is present in several of these very, very large, large metro areas. And I'll just present along with this three other three other facts and then get into an interpretation of the data. So just to, to kind of lay out the story here, we looked at basically a, a few different indicators. We looked at population flows, business flows, 
we looked at home prices and rents. So let's start with uh, population flow. So basically what this is showing is showing you deviations um, from the February 2020 flow values. That's why you see this value at zero for all the different regions. We're pooling together the top 12 uh, metro areas, so the biggest, most agglomerated metro areas in America, uh, and all our data here is limited to America, and we're splitting the data into four groups. The four groups are the city center, that's the central business district, then we have high density zip codes, uh, medium density zip codes, and low density zip codes, all within metro areas. And you can basically see there's significant uh, you know, net outflows from the, the city center. This accumulates to about 8% of population. You see something similar for businesses accumulating to about 15% of population. We think most of the business outflows are you know, sole proprietorships, uh, you know, individuals uh, who call themselves a business working for themselves. So the, we, there, there is some evidence that you know, larger businesses have you know, opened up more offices in suburbs compared to, or, or establishments in suburbs compared to city centers. The famous example of this is pret a uh, You know, they they have this Pret index, and they they've opened. Uh, if you if you're in London, you know they're everywhere. Uh, they're less by our office building in, in Covent Garden now than there used to be, and there's more uh, out in the suburbs in Zone Two and Zone Three of London. Um, but um, I think most of this is dominated by by really sole, sole proprietorships and individuals. This shows the picture quite clearly. Um, second fact is showing this happens in real estate markets as well. Um, and what, a couple of things to point out here. So you basically see that same feature where the city center falls in rents um, and in prices, it's in relative terms, not actually in absolute terms. We're seeing the city center fall relative to the, the surrounding suburbs and exurbs. And the two kind of interesting things to, to note are one, city centers have basically recovered pretty much to the pre-trend. So if you were to you know, take a linear, you know, take a linear fit of this pre-trend, extrapolate it out, you would probably get something close to where city centers are now, but exurbs and suburbs have kind of increased even more. And, and you see actually a similar thing with uh, home prices. City centers are actually pretty close to the, you know, their pre-trend, maybe even a little bit higher, um, but exurbs and suburbs are, are you know, have jumped even more. And I think you know, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is uh, people have put a greater premium on, on housing during the pandemic, more space. So they're willing to pay more for a square foot of housing. And we, there's some evidence of this. Um, perhaps because when you're working from home more, you're spending more time at home, you want more space, you want a bigger office, you want more amenities at home. And the second reason um, is, of course, because of the macro uh, environment. And this is something I've also written about a little um, in terms of mortgage rates and liquidity. Um, you know, of course, we saw huge buying of mortgage-backed securities by the by the Federal Reserve pushing down long-term mortgage rates. We saw a mechanical reduction of the the short shorter end of of the interest rate curve due to interest rate policy, and so that's another reason why we saw the, the macro housing market boom. And of course, we also have the stimulus stimulus checks in in, in America that that probably pushed up housing demand. So all these reasons are why you see a reallocation that's persisted between the city centers and the suburbs. Um, but there's been a recovery to pre-trend. But we think, and it'll offer evidence for this, um, this gap, at least a lot of it will persist. So one other fact before I get into interpreting the data. Um, so the donut effect is, is, is what we call large city phenomena. It's really most present in the, the biggest, most agglomerated metros. You see the top 12 here, you see a big donut, medium metros, you see a, a, you know, a smaller donut, maybe a mini donut and metro, the small metros, you basically see no donuts. So that's actually quite striking. And so our interpretation of this is, um, you know, cities that have high pre-existing levels of agglomeration. So, you know, we three factors that seem to predict it, a high share of population that can actually do their job from home. So they're more exposed to the remote workshop. You need some kind of force that pushes them out of city centers. So a high home price level uh, and population density seems to correlate with this um, as well. So yeah, actually, yeah, one other fact I realized I just included this at the last minute. This is quite interesting. This, this table is a bit confusing. So I'm just gonna uh, you know, focus you to, to two parts of this. This is actually new data that wasn't in our original paper. We're gonna release an update and, uh, with this soon. I just wanna focus on two things here. If you look at this bottom row, um, what this is showing you is the total net outflows from the city centers, the central business districts, 
And we're looking at metros of different sizes. So the different rows are the origin of people leaving city centers and the, the columns are their destinations. So if you focus on this last row of the table, you'll notice that the, the these three columns sum up to about minus 1% and these, th these three columns sum to about minus 0.6%. This data set ends in, uh, you know, December, November actually of 2020. So we don't get a lot of movement that occurred in 2021. That's why we're when we release our paper, we're going to have the new data. We don't have it yet. But the thing I'd like to suggest here is it seems that people are moving more to, you know, within the, the, the large metros of the country to their, you know, lower density, medium density and low density areas within um, the biggest metros of the country and the smaller share of people are moving to you know these uh, middle to, 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 to uh, small metros and rural areas so that's the ratio is maybe something like five to three and so get this actually the reason why i bring that up is it gets into our our interpretation of what to how to what to make of this all moving forward and and if we look at survey data and this survey data is from uh work that nick did with uh, his co-authors uh, jose barrero and steve davis you can see that uh, if we if we look at the percentage of paid full days working at home, of course we know it spiked at the start of COVID. It's been gradually declining, but it's still expected to you know equilibrate around 25% uh, of days post COVID, similar to the result Ilaria presented. Um, and most of this is happening in the hybrid format, right? It's happening where people are going to work a few days a week, but not um, uh, they're not working remotely full time. And there's uncertainty over this. Um, but what that means is you can only move to a nearby suburb. You can't necessarily move to another part of America or whichever country you're in entirely. And that's a key point to drive here, which is, you know, there's movement, there's both types of movement, right? We saw the ratio is five to three, but people are mostly moving to suburbs. Uh, a smaller fraction are moving to other metros entirely. And that's because we, we think it's because hybrid work is what, uh, you know, people and businesses are, are anticipating. So just to conclude, uh, offer some, some thoughts. This uh, donut effect doesn't occur in all cities. It's really the largest cities. Uh, the effects are partially reversing. Um, we saw that in the, in the earlier charts, but not completely. Um, and a third, a third thing to, to note here about this within versus between Metro Insight is that there's probably a lot of movement that's yet to happen especially the between metros. I want to maybe temper down the, the force of my claim. And that is probably because there's a lot of uncertainty over what post-COVID post -COVID working arrangements are going to look like. Businesses obviously delayed this quite a bit. We don't quite know about what the long run effects of working from home are on innovation. If it turns out to be a competitive disadvantage, you know, more firms, managers will, you know, probably want their workers to come back, they'll demand it, otherwise their firms will, will lose out to competition. So I think all of that is are, are the things to watch here. The productivity effect on innovation is probably the most uncertain one to, uh, from our perspective. Um, and kind of an interesting hypothesis, I think this could be another research project really, is what are the, 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 the nature of working arrangements in our paper and a lot of other papers, we've taken to be exogenous, you know, we've taken this to be a property of jobs. You know whether a tech job can be done from home but in reality a lot of jobs could be done from home don't have to be done from home it's kind of unclear um and really and, and so instead what matters is businesses are making decisions on the margin based on talent availability so i actually was traveling in southeast asia in singapore for you know a project for the economist two weeks ago and a number of startups there are just starting up remotely just because the country is so small and they need to hire engineering talent from other countries and so they they basically design their business to be remote first because talent is a competitive advantage, even if being fully remote is, is slightly disadvantageous. So I, you know, it could be an interesting modeling exercise to, you know, model remote work as, as endogenous to the distribution of talent. And the last thing, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more later, is of course the policy implications about this. I think most public transport networks are seeing reductions in revenues of you know 10 to 20 percent. This is being projected forward. It's kind of a big crisis for a lot of you know city public finance people. Um, so I think that's kind of a, a critical thing to think about. How do we redesign public transport networks uh, to to take advantage of this of, of this donut? Um, and on top of that, of course, is land use regulation. If people are going to the offices less often, maybe we can reimagine what we're using those buildings for. So I'm sure we'll talk about all this more lately, uh, later, but thanks so much for, for, for listening. Thank you, Artem. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, we have the, the, the privilege of hearing from our reporter, um, Louise Kempton. 
Um, Louise is a senior research associate in the Centre for Urban Regional Development Studies at Newcastle University. She's also Associate Dean of Research and Innovation for the University's Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. She has more than 25 years experience in local, regional and international economic development as a researcher, policymaker and practitioner. And her current focus is contributing through research and policy development to the shaping of an evolving understanding of the role of universities as anchor institutions in local, regional economic growth and innovation. So Louise, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and just to say, I'm, I'm here uh, today really representing the Regional Studies Association um, as a member of the RSA board. So on behalf of the Regional Studies Association, I'd like to thank all of the speakers, Andres, Ilaria and Arjun and, and Nadim, our chair today, and, and all of you for participating in, in this really interesting session. Um, this session has been organized in partnership with the OECD, uh, as uh, Nadim mentioned earlier, and just like to give particular thanks to Dorothy, Alain Dupre and Enrique Garcilazzo of the OECD for initiating this session. Um, this follows on from a very successful webinar we delivered together with the OECD Spatial Productivity Lab uh, based at the OECD Centre for Local Development in Trento on the new reality of teleworking. And just before I report back on, on what we've heard so far, I just want to say a few words about what the Regional Studies Association as an organisation has done in response to the pandemic to support its staff and its members. Um, all of our events and training programs moved to online and were made available to all for free of charge to support the Regional Studies Association members, but also the wider community globally during these difficult times. This e-festival, Regions in Recovery, uh, of which this plenary is a part, is just one example of that. Um, early in the pandemic, the Regional Studies Association put in place a resource library on COVID-19 studies. Uh, the board also set up a new grant scheme on pandemic cities, regions and industry, which has proved to be really popular amongst our members. And in terms of our own uh, staff, the, the RSA team moved to home working in March 2020, um, but are planning to start uh, moving to hybrid working in the coming months, which is a really um, interesting reflection on, on some of what we heard from the speakers about this new normal that we're moving towards. Um, so just to um, come on to the presentations that we've heard and a couple of points I think uh, were, were really interesting and worth highlighting and hopefully this will maybe um, spark some questions because I think there's a lot to um, unpick from these really interesting uh, bits of research. So Andres um, highlighted the importance in place in reinforcing uh, pre-existing inequalities. I think this is really um, important for us as uh, regional studies uh, people um, where you know, we know place matters and geography matters. Um, and, and, and these effects uh, in some cases reinforce pre-existing inequalities. And also I think he showed how they impacted on different places in different ways. Um, so, for example, working remotely was most likely in, in wealthy places, tending tend to be big or capital cities, um, and least likely in peripheral, rural and less developed places. And of course, uh, this has resulted in people in those places being disproportionately impacted by the pa pandemic, both economically, but also very importantly in terms of their health. And I think we've, we've seen a, a lot of data and statistics coming out uh, around this. So where people were not able to work remotely, where they had to maintain frontline positions, it put them at much greater um, vulnerability from the, from the virus. And he finished by outlining some possible scenarios uh, for, for the future of cities, which um, I, uh, the, the, the next two speakers touched on as well. And I think this might be an interesting point um, for discussion as well amongst the participants. Um, so then moving on to um, Arjun's presentation, um, he's talked about how the pandemic has uh, stimulated a new equilibrium, um, higher productivity and working from home, which was really interesting, though I, you know, I guess not all sectors or occupations will have been affected equally. Um, and when we're looking at some of those uh, big urban areas, uh, it's probably uh, greater concentrations of knowledge workers and, and, and so on. So I guess when we think about other sectors and places that are dominated by different kinds of industries, we might see a different effect there. Um, the evidence that Arjun showed us uh, was showing um, maybe some, some sense of cities bouncing back, um, though, though obviously as well, the growth in real estate prices in the suburbs is clear. Um, and, uh, and the donut effect is clearly a big city phenomenon. 
So Arjun also talked about this new, this new normal emerging of hybrid working, um, which actually very uh, interesting point that he raised that it actually may limit absolute mobility because people still need to be proximate to cities where they're, they're having to travel in one or two days per week. So it's, it's, it's not a case of we can all just go and uh, live in a, in, in, in a shack up the mountain as long as we have a good internet connection. Um, and then he raised a few questions about what the long term impact might be. You know, we don't know yet what this will be uh, entirely and particularly in terms of long term productivity and innovation impacts and what that what that will mean for uh, th this this new normal. Um, and then uh, coming on to Ilaria's uh, presentation. So um, there were some interesting commonalities with Arjun's uh, findings from the US in terms of uh, her presentation about results from Milan. Um, she raised the point that home working is not the best place to work. I think a lot of us after the last two years can really um, can really sympathize with that, uh, but outlined uh, the possibility of a third way in terms of these, you know, hubs um, and, and so on, which I think is something that would be really uh, interesting to hear if anybody in the audience has some um, reflections or experiences on that or about these new spaces and new ways of working, which will probably require new, new policies as well for, for employers. Um, so again, um, reinforcing some of the earlier speakers, the proximity to major cities is still important, but this could be for various reasons. So technological, access to human capital, but also probably other reasons as well that people like to be near big cities, cultural and, and you know, life experience kind of things as well. Um, but also, you know, the, the points that Arjun was making about um, this hybrid working and the need for this proximity to be able to go into the office um, from time to time. So I suppose that the, the question really that all of them are, are, are hinting at is, will the purpose of, of big cities change? Um, and Ilaria finished by, by talking about a range of policy areas that will need to be adjusted um, to the new post-COVID paradigm, whatever that might be. So those were just some of my reflections um, on three really interesting presentations, and I'm really looking forward now to um, some discussion with the rest of the uh, participants. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Louise. That, that was excellent. I think certainly the, the issues around the policy implications are something we should certainly explore and hopefully we'll have an awful lot more to say on that as we go forward. But perhaps just to, to, to start the, the ball rolling, I'll throw out a question um, um, to, to the presenters. And um, I mean, you saw from Andres's presentation that, that there, we have a potential number of uh, scenarios that are emerging. You know, and whilst I think that um, certainly your presentations are pushing perhaps to the donut effect as being one of the, uh, the likely scenarios or perhaps the most likely scenario. I mean, let, let's, let's keep the, the conversation open around the possibility of different scenarios emerging. I mean, given all of that, do, do you think that, um, that the various scenarios are in effect um, zero sum games? You know, in other words, we're going to see fierce competition from regions for digital workers in particular, and indeed perhaps even other workers as well, you know, capitalizing on, on remote working more generally or the ability to provide Different types of services remotely. Um, and so, so do you think that um, that there are perhaps mutual gains and possibilities for other forms of interaction ac across territories? So who who would like to answer that first? I'll choose you, Arjun. Sure. <laughs> I mean, um, so this is an interesting question. I think Lucas Altos and some co-authors at, at Princeton have a interesting pa paper. I think it was originally called the, the City Paradox, where they showed the outflow of people from city centers depressed consumption spending on, on local services quite a bit, face-to-face -face services, and that's expected to persist. I think five to 10% reduction in consumption I've seen uh, in some survey data. So, you know, that shows you that, you know, the presence of people has spillovers on other people. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, these kind of knowledge workers, they probably have the largest spillovers. Um, and, you know, that's why we're, that, that, of course, will cause some economic pain in the short run. In the long term, I think it's probably more of a win-win, especially if the productivity gains are, 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 are the productivity, you know, the lack of productivity fall, maybe a better way of putting it, it persists because um, people have more options for where to live. Um, and my movement uh, out of a city center to a suburb makes things cheaper for people who, who choose to say or who who where it makes more more sense to say so you know I see this as as mostly a positive sun phenomenon in the long run per, with disruptions in the, in the in the short term I think the case in which 
it could have negative effects in the long term is we're uncertain about the productivity impacts on innovation and so forth. We, you know, we just assume that there's not going to be a big, big effect. And then we turn, uh, we, it turns out 10 years from now, we're like, we're all the new ideas. We're all the new, new companies coming out of these city centers. It's not happening anymore. I think that's unlikely to happen. We've seen a huge amount of innovation during the pandemic. We've seen, if you just look at new business starts. You look at number of new startups gaining really high valuations. I, I, I think it's unlikely, but you know, that's the risk. Thanks. I'll, I'll perhaps have a follow-up question on that in a second, but Ilaria, did you want to answer the question as well? Yes, um, I think that the one aspect that uh, we should uh, take into consideration is that the, um, the, the trend of digital nomads, of remote workers, uh, and also of uh, yeah, these uh, slow innovators. So now, I know that is a, a niche, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, was not, uh, we were probably not uh, even talking about uh, so much about these, uh, these, uh, these people. So um, I think something is, uh, is happening and also uh, less uh, central areas are, uh, are becoming and will become more uh, attractive also for people uh, living in, uh, in, uh, in the cities. We are talking about people that probably don't have, I mean, from the studies that don't have children. So they are young couples or young people. So they are kind of more free. But um, uh, there are these experiments going on, going on, going on. For instance, I, uh, last uh, month, a few weeks ago, I went to Venice to interview a professor of uh, the University Kafoskari that launched this uh, project that is called Veniware. So uh, making Venice uh, a, a place to attract digital nomads. Venice became a ghost city during the pandemic. There were no tourism, nothing. So a place like Venice uh, that I don't know if it's a central place because it became really a ghost city can become a very, a very, very good place for digital nomads that have to stay there at least six months because the idea is that they go there but they stay, they live there, they, um, uh, 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 they uh, produce uh, uh, for, for the city and they have uh, to, uh, there, there might be a spillover in the city. This might be a way to change, no? to change the face, to change the future of uh, some, uh, some places. Uh, the other way around, uh, uh, this, this, yeah, last, last week I interviewed some co-working spaces in mountain areas in uh, uh, South Tyrol, and they are attracting, for instance, uh, people from uh, uh, living in Berlin that moved there with the family, with the kids, because in uh, South Tyrol, in the, in the schools, you also speak German, uh, because they, during the pandemic, they really suffered, suffered the city, so they want to go back to the nature, to then it's true that the city is a city and that, uh, I mean, in the mountain, you uh, breath uh, fresh air, but you don't have the opera. Uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, this is a trend worthwhile to, I think, to, uh, to study and to, to explore. Yes, I would say, so perhaps um, for both of you, I guess, um, because of course, you know, if we're seeing some of these trends emerging, um, where people are beginning to start thinking about, you know, the digital nomad moving back essentially to cities. I mean, is that is that sort of pushing against the the donut effect? Are we seeing perhaps, you know, the the net effect is that we are going to see people moving back into cities? It's just a different type of person. There's some who choose to live perhaps in the hinterland, the suburbs, and some who choose to say, well, an opportunity for me to go and live and work in these wonderful cities like Venice, for example, that weren't there before. Is that a potential outcome? Happy to add a quick thought on this. I, I think it is possible. Um, it really depends in, in, in the, the kind of model in our paper kind of ignores is it's one of the limitations is, is amenities, exactly what you're mentioning. You know, the restaurants, coffee shops, movies, the, the presence of other people who are similar, all these things are, matter a lot. And, you know, the, the, the force keeping people close to their job has, has reduced. So people reallocate, you know, they're in their utility function, a, a greater share of, of their utility is now coming from um, being close to amenities. Um, so I think, I think it is possible now, whether, um, 
I guess, I guess the question is, is there a correlation between the places that were previously highly agglomerated and the places with the most amenities? In a lot of cities there are, but not all of them perhaps. So, you know, I think, I think it, it kind of depends on the, the characteristics of a given city. But I think that is, I think that is a possible possibility that you just cycle the mix of people who live in a given city. Now, I think that doesn't necessarily mean, what, what that could mean is you have an equilibrium where you have just as many people in the city, but you probably have slightly lower real estate prices and rents compared to the counterfactual still, because the mix of people who live in cities now are, are those who perhaps were less willing to pay the exorbitant prices that existed beforehand. So I think, I think you, know, you could have an equilibrium where the net populations return, but you have slightly lower prices compared to the, the counterfactual. Hello. Well, I think about uh, we, all, all we know, and you also said it uh, that uh, yeah, there are differences. So, for instance, London uh, uh, lost more people than Milan, and there are differences also in the uh, remote working phenomenon. Because in Italy, as you know, we are the the country of industrial districts where uh, firms are uh, small and very small. So, for uh, there is a correlation between uh, the uh, willingness to uh, uh, allow uh, the employees to remote uh, to work in, work remotely and the size of the of the uh, of the firm and similarly also there is a correlation between uh, remote working and the specialization of the firm so in Italy, uh, this uh, um, uh, remote working uh, is uh, is present now, but uh, I don't know uh, if in uh, I mean October 2000 because now there is uh, yeah there is a deadline is uh, uh, September October 2022 things will uh, change, will uh, become as uh, before uh, the pandemic. So this very much depends by the share of remote workers over the total and uh, what the companies will decide. Uh, so for, if we look at the data of Eurofund and OECD, uh, Italy jumped increasingly no, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the classification in terms of uh, 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 remote working index, because we were very uh, in, the, in the lowest position together with, with Greece. Now uh, things uh, uh, changed, but we don't know for how long. No? Um, about the, the, the issue of uh, new working spaces, uh, I should say that while the research uh, underlines that uh, while in northern uh, European countries, uh, uh, um, public libraries use uh, uh, co -working sp public working spaces in order to reduce the commuting to uh, the city center, for instance, in Norway to Oslo, uh, uh, to reduce congestion, so the, all the negative externalities. These things are these things are happening now in Southern Europe. So there are, I mean, uh, I think uh, very much uh, a lot of differences according to the uh, the, the, the city, to the, the the structure of the economy, uh, to the attitude of uh, of uh, yes, to the changes in the labor market and, uh, and so on and so forth. I have a few questions, but I mean, in, in, in the spirit of fairness, I'm going to take some of the questions from the chat that have appeared. And the first one's come from Louise. Um, and her question is, um, what about impacts on people in sectors who can't work from home, but work in cities? And are there potential negative effects, e.g. reduced public transport, which might eventually result in even wider disparities between high and low income, high income people saving on transport costs, etc. And this, I think, touches to the core of the uh, of the discussion we're having today around income and you know, inequalities in general, who wants to take that first? Well, I, I can say yes, uh, you are uh, right, Louise, and uh, there are also studies about this. No, so there has uh, been a huge uh, negative impact on these people. So uh, uh, working in. Uh, uh, um, the, the sectors that are not uh, the, where, where they, can, they couldn't uh, work remotely, 
And there is also a huge impact on women, no? So there are reports uh, showing uh, how much, uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 the share of uh, uh, women that lost their jobs, uh, especially their job, because we couldn't do uh, other way, uh, because during the, no, the lockdown, they have uh, they had kids to take care or also relatives to take care. So uh, it's true. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, we are talking about uh, remote workers that are uh, part of the, uh, of the labor market uh, that are, uh, uh, have been more, uh, uh, yeah, have been luckier. Um, but then there is a, a, a huge, a huge piece of the population that uh, uh, have been uh, um, negatively impact, impact, impacted, uh, uh, including women in general. I mean, high knowledge, uh, skilled, or, or not. Artemis, you nodding your head, so you're in full agreement. Yeah, I have little, little to add. I just I just dropped two papers in the in the chat um, okay. on on how the the outflow of of skilled workers spills over into impacts on um, uh, you know service workers, less less skilled workers, um, and it's quite striking. I mean, one of the questions that I had in in regards to that as well is if we are going to see some of these outflows. Now, are we going to see, for example, some of the the, the agglomeration effects that have always been there in cities also declining? You, you made a very strong pitch around, for example, productivity is, has remained high um, during all this. But is there, is there a risk that over the long term we begin to, to lose some of the agglomeration effects that have driven the productivity gaps between large cities and rural and smaller cities? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's, um, that's exactly right, uh, Nadim. I think you, you, you're see, it's, it's, like, it's a reduction, but not an elimination of uh, agglomeration economies. I think that's what um, maybe summarizes what's happened. You see, basically, you know, there are different metaphors for it, right? We we use a donut. You could use a cracked egg. I think um, I've seen people use where you know you still have the the the, the kind of yolk in the middle, but it s s diffuses out a little bit further. You have a little bit more, um, you know, urban sprawl. I think all that points to slightly less agglomeration. And of course, there is a sizable fraction of people who are working fully remotely, even if it's not the majority. Um, and that's why we saw the outflows out of big metros as well. So I think, yeah, agglomeration economies have probably been reduced a bit, but have not been eliminated. And again, as, as you pointed out, the long, long term productivity effects are still uncertain. So maybe there will be some kind of um, resurgence of agglomeration five, 10 years down the road if we find out we're losing out on all these new ideas, but I think unlikely. Well, it's the argument that's being used within firms as well, you know, the network effects, for example, bringing people back into the office, you can exchange and bounce those ideas that you don't necessarily get the same in the virtual environment. I Ilaria, did you want to say anything on, on the agglomeration effects? Uh, yes, uh, I mean, the, yeah, the, the, the city will remain, the, uh, will, uh, 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 will have its uh, I mean, uh, uh, predominant role uh, still. Um, I was just reading also the other question was about uh, uh, why uh, people uh, um, are uh, uh, still attracted by the city and why real estate prices are increasing. I think that uh, in a way, this is what I mean, the interview with Phil McCann, I, uh, that I was in uh, little uh, article, he was saying that the city will become more attractive for young people and there will be a kind of a change you know, uh, in, in uh, also uh, commercial uh, uh, services. So uh, um, th there will be a renewed, uh, a renewed uh, uh, um, there will be new uh, commercial services mainly run by young that were not so scared like uh, elderly uh, uh, of the, the COVID pandemic. And this happened. I mean, I can see that this happened in, uh, in Milan, for instance. But still, uh, the city is, uh, is a city. So uh, uh, um, what we were expecting, and I was hoping, uh, a kind of redistribution of, uh, in a way, of uh, and, uh, more equality. Uh, but uh, we, we should uh, uh, yeah, study and look at the data to, to understand whether this has happened or it was just uh, 
uh, related to the, the first period uh, just uh, during and uh, during the pandemic. It was a first shock, but that, then things will uh, will uh, go go back i think there will be uh, there is uh, just a, a, an attraction of different people uh, into the city that uh, uh, couldn't uh, access the city because uh, there uh, there was uh, no uh, supply for them no so in a way we could see many for instance many uh, uh, um, uh, there was a higher supply of uh, apartments uh, in uh, to, to be rented and so on that was uh, there wasn't before. Uh, but still, uh, no, uh, there is a high supply but high demand, uh, and perhaps there is a change of population uh, 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 that the city is attracting. Okay, um, perhaps move on now to an another question that we have that came up in the chat. And there's quite a few of them, so I'll try to to read through them. As, as quickly as possible. Um, but, but one's from Thomas Jensen from Nord Regio, uh, most of very good partners of ours at the, at the CFE. Um, and his, his questions um, in relation to the, perhaps the, this distinction between um, you know, the declining population on the one hand and rising housing prices in central urban areas and the others, and uh, wondering whether or not that was due to investment or speculation in real estate. I guess because that was something that you flagged up, Arjun, perhaps you could uh, answer it. I mean, there was a, a bounce back. My own view is that it's perhaps not necessarily going to be permanent, but far away. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think we're going to see how permanent it is now that interest rates are, are rising again across all across the yield curve, both at the short end and also at the long end. So I think a lot of it was just interest rates and discounting. Um, you know, we know that home prices are, are heavily uh, affected by, by the, by the long-term interest rate that determines what your mortgage bill is, how much whether people can afford to, to, to take out a mortgage or not. I think it was you know, a simple effect, effect, you know, mechanical reduction in interest rate leads to an increase in home prices. That's number one. Number two is space premium. Um, in general, I think there's been a bigger premium on, on what a square foot because of work, the rise of working from home and the fact that people were in, were in lockdown. Some of that will, will persist, I think. And the third, of course, is the stimulus. You had demand driven, um, you know, people have more cash. Probably the first effect I think is the biggest, and Nadim, I think you're right. We'll, we'll you know, some of that will probably uh, we're already seeing a slowing down in the growth rate of, of home prices. On the supply side, you know, across the uh, developed markets, you know, there are a lot of people who have dropped out of the labor force, so there's a you know a shortage of of workers, construction workers in particular. So I think that's one reason why this supply curve is more more uh, inelastic, and this increase in demand has translated into price. Uh, whether we'll get more construction workers eventually, whether we'll get you know, especially in these cities, it's very hard to build housing like San Francisco. You, it's very, very difficult to build up. So um, that's another reason why demand has translated the price. Um, just one other thought on the you know separate topic on the, the innovation point earlier. I just wanted to pass along a paper that shows uh, kind of an interesting insight on how uh, work from home might affect within firm productivity. It turns out this, this paper shows that basically fragments the within firm collaboration network. Uh, it's a nature paper looking at Microsoft emails. Um, and that's actually a question I might I might ask for everyone in the audience. Have you seen any great research on speculating about the long term productivity effects? I'm very interested in that. So if, if anyone has any thoughts, I'd be curious to hear. OK, I'll, I'll, move, I'll move on now to to another question. Perhaps you can take this one um, first, Ilaria. I mean, the, there's a question from Dimitri Korpakis from Brussels. And um, his question is, um, it seems that cultural factors play a strong role here, potentially stronger than we think. In the US, uh, people are more inclined to continue to work from home, even if the pandemic recedes, while in, in Europe, people were quick to proclaim liberation from restrictive measures, even if the pandemic is still around. But what's, what's your view? I tend to agree that the sense of liberation in Europe is, is, quite, is quite strong, for sure. Ilaria. I don't, I don't know, perhaps. <laughs> I'm just thinking that perhaps in Europe uh, there is a higher uh, uh, density. So kind of people are more used to live in uh, cities and then for them it's uh, more difficult to, to live, uh, to stay home and uh, don't be, don't go to the city to work if I compare it with the US, you know, where there is, uh, people are, I mean, are used to, to to, so it's uh, there is more sprawl, so they are uh, pro probably uh, more used also to work remotely. Uh, I mean, if we look at uh, really the data about Europe, you know that in Northern Europe, 
people who are working remotely, but in partially central, but also Southern Europe, people, I mean, they, they had no, no uh, idea of uh, what was uh, working remotely. They were working, going to the office also because, as I said before, if you work for a small uh, company, the manager, well, first of all, you have uh, uh, different responsibilities. So you have to be there and work with the others. And uh, then uh, in a family firm, for instance, there is also this, uh, this issue uh, that the manager, that is the owner of the firm, wants to see you there and kind of control you. Uh, this is uh, something very much related to the size of the firm. I was going to see you nodding your head again. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you want to come in and un unmute, but otherwise nodding your head oh, is taken, it's full agreement. Yeah, full, full agreement. I'll just add, add one thing, which is that our, uh, our our New York office is empty and our uh, our, our London office is quite quite full. So, <laughs> yeah. There we go. That, that's, that's, that's a great example. I mean, but I think perhaps one of the important things, certainly something that I've seen from some of my travels over the last few months now, uh, allow the travel again, is that even within Europe, there are quite large differences, um, cultural, I mean, so we see the cultural differences, not just between Europe and the US, um, but I think also within, within Europe itself, I mean, Eastern Europe, Northern Europe, and, and Southern Europe, I think certainly are three places where I've seen very stark differences. And I think it's also a function of how bad um, COVID was, was hit, was hit the country. I mean, although there was strong comparisons, I mean, I think the perception of how bad it hit has also had an impact in terms of how people want to feel liberated. And so that there are differences that are appearing. Um, Louisa had a, another, I think it was a comment rather than a question, but it's a good comment all the same. So I think it has a sort of, um, it, it leads straight back in again to the discussion around inequalities. Because of course, you know, working from home and hybrid working will affect people at different career stages. And there's obviously a, a certain impact here. And we think about the demographic aspects, the age, you know, age, the young versus the old. And the young, of course, have, have been quite hard hit by the, uh, by the, by the crisis, and certainly in terms of employment impacts. Um, so, I mean, do, do, you, do you feel, for example, there are some rifts that might appear there in terms of generational um, issues that might appear? I mean, you've already said, for example, that some of the young might start taking advantage of moving back to cities that allows them to develop some of these cluster effects and networks. But are there also risks involved that find you know, seeing this polarization taking place? Um, probably seen in the news, uh, some, some, some inv prominent investment banks such as Goldman, David Solomon has publicly said, you know, he, he's against hybrid work. He thinks it kind of hurts the apprenticeship model that's core to investment banking where early employees get to observe how their managers and so, so forth um, um, work. So I, I, think, I think there are, this is, this is a really, really important point. This is a key reason why I think, you know, it's unlikely we'll get full-time remote work for a large number of firms, especially those that hire lots of early career people. Um, whether you hybrid is good enough versus, you know, we see this kind of resurgence of regular working patterns, I think probably uncertain. I'm a little bit more uh, skeptical about the return to fully remote, in a, or sorry, a return to fully in-person, um, a little bit more, uh, you know, expecting hybrid to, to, to remain. But I think this is really important important point in terms of um, maintaining company culture, onboarding new employees, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and actually, if I could just add one kind of related thing on the previous previous question, I one question I have generally for the audience, if anyone wants to respond in the chat or, or maybe speak up, um, is on commercial real estate. I think we've, we've talked a lot about the housing market. That's what all our evidence is. I haven't really seen great data on commercial real estate that's able to kind of, you know, create a, a very precise geographically concentrated price index. So I, if anyone has a, a cool study to point, point us to, I'd be very curious. Andres, do you want to say something on that? Because you know, we've got some anecdotal information on the commercial real estate data that we're beginning to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, we, in, in, the, in that report that we did with the, with the G7 countries, um, we worked together with some real estate companies and, but we, we one from Amsterdam, um, this anecdote again is uh, rents are going or stagnated in, in cities, in center of cities. I can, I can, I'm looking for the for the report. I posted in, in the chat, and, and outside cities uh, going up. Um, but again, that is not a geographically comparable index across um, across, across countries. 
Um, that, that's it. Uh, Nadia, I wanted to just probably say in innovation, I think um, it's important to 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 stay a bit open in, in terms of the future. I mean, because, well, we, we, I think uh, Arjun says well that uh, one is the middle term, the long term, but really technology is moving too fast that uh, with this new meta or other uh, augmented reality, probably there are other ways to improve innovation uh, without the face-to-face -face, uh, contact, no? So that you just, just to leave this comment there. Yep, it's an, an, another evolution in the step of, well, another, another step in human evolution, I think, finding new ways to, to innovate and interact with each other. And I think we're all finding our feet in this one. We're learning new tricks and learning new ways of communicating. So who knows, maybe, maybe that is going to replace the, the water cooler effect. Because um, <laughs> that wasn't there itself not so long ago. So uh, but let, me, let me move on to perhaps some, some other questions. We have a question from Per Christensen, the senior regional planner from Sweden. And this question is, will remote working combined with relocation be an effective measure to address climate change? And of course, this is, I think, something that um, both of you, I think, mentioned in, in your intervention, just in terms of transport and power. Well, maybe it was you, Louise, but certainly there's, a, there's an issue in terms of uh, emissions or working from home and emissions from home. So. Who'd like to be first in that one? Arjun, I see your, your, mic is, your mic is unmute, so you can perhaps go first. Sure, I, I don't have too much to add other than I've seen a little bit of evidence that, um, you know, the agglomerations tend to be, um, I guess it depends on the composition of your, your energy, but tend to be good for, for, for climate change in the sense of office space. Um, you, you kind of get some economies of scale, if you will, with, with energy use relative to everyone having their own residential unit that's, you know, building out uh, heat or, or air conditioning all day. So I think I think in the, in the short term, this is unfortunately perhaps, at least on energy usage within, within buildings, not necessarily good for, 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 for that. Uh, perhaps the benefit is less, less dependence on, on transportation. If you have to commute less, I don't actually know how the calculus weighs up between the two. I wonder if maybe perhaps Laria has thoughts on that, but yeah. Uh, yeah, well, uh, about this issue, the concept of the strategy of a 50 minute city is uh, goes in this direction. So the idea is that uh, within the neighborhood, and this is mainly related to a city, you can find the main uh, services, including uh, the place where to work. So also um, the municipalities in the city, so for instance, the municipality of Milan adopted this uh, uh, near working policy offering the uh, uh, workers of the municipality of Milan places, uh, public uh, uh, spaces where to work uh, instead of working at home and uh, instead of uh, taking the public transportation to uh, work uh, 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 in the office. And then in this, uh, in this uh, uh, about this, also the real estate uh, uh, companies are developing uh, more and more uh, hybrid and uh, uh, flexible spaces, um, not only in the city center as we were uh, used to, to see, but also in uh, medium-sized cities and also in the peripheral neighborhoods uh, of the city uh, in order to be uh, closer from one point of view to, for instance, a, 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 a public pa parking lot close to a, a, the underground so people can drive by car, work there, and when they need, they take the underground the local private transportation to reach the center of the city. Then there is the issue of companies that uh, rent uh, uh, meeting rooms in this uh, uh, network, network of real estate um, companies around the world. So their uh, employees work uh, from home, but then they need to meet, they need to meet the customers, so they can use these uh, uh, meeting rooms or also office spaces and co-working spaces uh, in, uh, in, uh, all over the world. So this is a really a new, a new trend that is happening. I think we've um, come to the end of questions on the chat. I have um, one um, additional question, and um, I think I think it's more about the the the, the, the longer term consequences of, um, of remote work. I mean, what what do you do? You think that this is going to become a potential tool to close many of those gaps that we've seen in inequalities 
regional inequalities already is it or is it going to be something that might exacerbate them i think that on the basis of what we've heard so far it's difficult to say because of course we're seeing um, a varied um i think response to, you know, depending on where you are and what type of city you are what type of region you are uh, but do you think that generally there's an opportunity for remote working to to be an effective tool to close gaps it's depending on the right policies of course it's a leading question i'm afraid Um, so I think uh, Brookings just had a really good study on on this on this question on in, in, just in the American case kind of superstars superstar studies whether you know pandemic will allow there to be a, a, a rise of the rest in terms of other cities not just the suburbs um, and I think the the tentative short term conclusion is a little bit but not a lot um, so. Uh, you know, the one reason why is because even if the 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 peep outflow out of the big cities is, is is sizable, the places people go, it's it's relatively diffuse, right? There's lots of uh, mid tier cities, lots of rural areas for people to go, so it's hard to to kind of um, get you know attract a, a sizable number. I think I think frankly in in the I I actually looked at the Tulsa remote. Um, project a, a little bit very brief analysis um which was the program i think T tulsa and oklahoma was paying people ten thousand dollars remote workers to relocate there and there is an effective very very little effect on uh spillover effects in, in terms of population inflows or, or real estate prices so i think it, it you know again it's, it's it's uncertain it'll take time to happen certainly some places have benefited a lot like austin um in in texas is you know one of the fastest growing uh metro areas in, in the country by long shot COVID has accelerated that I think it's one of those cases where if you have the the underlying ingredients, you know, for you know a good university nearby, you have the underlying ingredients. It probably supports those those places, but it's very difficult to kick start start something um, off the ground without those underlying ingredients. I think, um, but I, I, yes, yeah, so, so I think the overall is I think it is a, is, a, is a force for a little bit more balance, but maybe not maybe not a lot. I'll just drop that paper in the in the chat. Right, Hilary. Uh, but I think that the, still it's an option that, as I said, that we didn't have before. Uh, so this is something I think very, very important. If I think also about the sustainability, uh, uh, working remotely and also working as we are doing online has a huge impact on the sustainability. So let's think how many flights we were taking. I know. I know it's not the same, and so it's important, especially in conferences, a seminar, and meet, meet and speak, because then good ideas, innovative ideas, creative ideas come uh, during lunch, uh, uh, in front of a coffee. I know, but it's also true that uh, uh, we reduced, uh, hugely reduced, even too much, uh, the travel by flight, for instance. No, and then last uh, week, because I started traveling a bit in the last two weeks. I was in Brussels, and in Brussels, there is the issue of uh, uh, reaching Brussels by plane. You know? There are some rules at the university or, or also in uh, institutes that they say, uh, uh, you, if you can reach the place by train, you have to take the train. Okay. So sometimes in my, for instance, uh, uh, European project, the cost action where uh, the networking is funded, uh, if we want to uh, uh, organize a meeting in a place that is not reachable by train, people don't come. So this is an issue, no? So this is a, the, the good, the, the, the positive point of view of working remotely, working uh, uh, and also hybrid, also for the for the for the sustainability. So um, I shouldn't. I should also look at this. Uh, uh, this as an opportunity, as an opportunity uh, also for the environment, also for uh, less uh, central areas, uh, and uh, and about um, Ariana was uh, saying uh, about uh, places in the U.S. offering incentives uh, uh, to people to move uh, to live and work there. We have uh, several uh, uh, places also in uh, in Europe, so in Catalonia or in uh, in the south of Italy. In south of Italy, there is a movement that is called uh, South Working. Um, that uh, was born during the pandemic. So people that migrated from the south or from inner areas in Italy to the north of Italy or to the north uh, northern Europe, or even uh, 
uh, the US came back because they could work remotely and making a movement. You know? Then when you make the, and we analyze this, analyze this data, you see that are mainly knowledge workers, that are mainly couples without children, okay. But still, this uh, was not happening uh, 10 years ago. Thank you. Louise, Andres, I realized that I haven't given you much chance to say a few things and that you contributed on the chat and said a few things. Do you want us just to say a few words before we, we wrap up as we're coming close to the end and I wanted to give the opportunity of perhaps some reflections on your side? Not compulsory. <laughs> go, go, Luis, if you want. <laughs> no, go ahead, Andres, and I'll, I'll just say a few words at the end. Okay. No, no, I, 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 I think I, do, I just want to say, coming back to the scenarios, um, that, well, these scenarios were built, uh, uh, and we based on these papers that, uh, that you, uh, Arjun, and the other colleagues of City Paradox so in, in different universities have uh, developed. Um, but I think, I think we do see the, the relevance of uh, flexible policies that, that at least uh, put the basic uh, ingredients for everyone to, to benefit from, from this trend. Um, I, I, I think you, you mentioned, Aaron and, and, and Hilaria, the, the policies on to attract uh, remote workers to rural regions uh, with tax incentives. We think also that probably that also could, could lead to uh, competition in terms of, of uh, rural areas attracting and, and reducing taxes. That probably is not, not the, the good way in general. Um, but, uh, but at least providing the, the basic, uh, that we call it enabling factors in every region can, can be a, a, a good way to, to attract uh, uh, families. We, we also are thinking the, this, in, this um, relevance of attracting nomads instead of uh, attracting families, uh, okay. the whole tele, the remote worker with the family probably is more relevant, but it's an ongoing uh, research still. Hmm. Louise? Yeah, thanks, Nadim. Um, yeah, so obviously I'm not a researcher on this topic, but I find this all really interesting. And, and um, you know, as a, as a geographer and somebody who's interested in regional studies, I, it's the impact on people and places that I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to, to learn more about. And I think so far it would seem like in terms of people, it, it does seem to have really amplified those pre-existing inequalities at all kinds of levels, generational, social, economic, health, ethnic. Um, and I think that's something of a real, real concern that we're going to see these kind of, um, you know, what the impact will be on society when, when these, these um, inequalities get, get reinforced and amplified further. Um, I think in terms of impact on places, I think the jury's maybe a bit still out, you know, in terms of what's going to happen in, in the longer term. I mean, we obviously had an immediate impact, which was positive for some places and less positive for others, but longer term. And I think this is the real challenge for policymakers about how can we seize this? How can they seize this opportunity to be imaginative? Um, and, you know, some of the, some of the things that the um, origin and Ilari have just talked about, about, you know, some, some places trying to attract new people um, and try to reinvigorate them. So I really hope policymakers don't miss the opportunities um, for, 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 for changing maybe um, some of those trajectories of certain places. But, but I think the, the real concern is about the impact on, on people and the, and the inequalities that, that this is going to lead to. Thanks, Louise, and, uh, and thanks also to, to Arjun, Ilari, and, and Andres. Oh, uh, Arjun, you, your hand raised. All right, I just had one last thought that's maybe a little bit more uh, optimistic as well. I, I think one area where there's very little research, but it seems like a lot is, is happening is on the, the international dimension to this, you know, cross-country collaborations. Um, you know, I mentioned Singapore earlier, where, you know, when you're constrained by talent, you're much more likely to, at a very early stage startup, start hiring people from another country. I think that's actually a very positive development that we have seen. I haven't seen great data on this. I think it's a very, you know, rich research topic. Um, and, but um, I, I, anecdotally, it seems quite important, especially in certain parts of the world. And one thing that I think reason why it will take a long time for this to happen is again, because of the difference between startups and big firms, it's much easier for a small firm to, to kind of design their working arrangements to support such a pattern 
for a big firm, it's more difficult. So I think that's why it'll take time. And the last thought I'll add is, you know, just looking very much forward, a little speculative, a lot of this, the, the, the stuff that's going on in the, the Web3 kind of cryptocurrency community, if you look at it, it's, it's entirely been developed um, in a decentralized fashion. It's not just a decentralized technology, it's also a fully remote technology from all parts of the world. I think we're seeing a huge shift in where innovative activity is occurring. So if you just look at data on unicorns, you know, private billion dollar technology startups, they used to be almost all from America, from Silicon Valley. Now it's like highly spread out to many, many different hubs across the world, Bangalore, Singapore, Sao Paulo, and Brazil. So I think, and that was certainly accelerated by, by COVID, uh, allowing talent in all these parts of the world to, to, to kind of access capital to plug into digital technologies and so forth. So I think I think that that's possibly one place where I see a lot of optimistic trends on the international uh, dimension here. Thank you. Lara, you're staying on mute. That's fine. No, no, no compunction. We're, we're close. We're close to the end. So it leads me to just to have a, a very quick wrap up. And I think my wrap up is going to be very short and sweet because I think we've said it a few times before. And I think it holds true as much now as it did when we started. I think the jury is still out. Um, but I think that at the same time, what we have seen, I think, certainly from the uh, discussions and the presentations that we've had, is that wherever we end up landing, I think we're going to see a landing zone that basically is, is relatively fragmented. We're going to see a variety of different landing zones. And I think that's ex exactly why you know, being, I think, future proof around different scenarios is exactly the right strategy, because it seems to me that we're going to have basically a variety of those things appearing in different places, depending on the underlying circumstances. We had a few questions in the chat, for example, around the importance of culture, and I think that will also shape, to some extent, the landing zone that we're going to see in, in different places. I did want to take an opportunity of flagging up um, in closing, of course, you know, we're, we're going to carry on um, closely looking at this um, within the OECD and certainly within, within the Centre for Entrepreneurship, including through our Trento Centre. I've done a lot of work in this too. Um, and um, our next um, regional outlook publication, which comes out this year, will also have a, a dedicated section looking very closely at this issue and building on the work that Andrew has presented already, looking at the impact in G7 countries. And so we know we're broadening that, and hopefully it'll touch on many of the issues that have been raised during this discussion, and indeed perhaps even the question that you yourself just raised now, Arjun, around the internationalization. So I think keep, keep, keep your eyes peeled for that, and certainly you know, we, can certain, we can make sure that information is, is available and to those of you who are looking on, on, on our website now. Now, one of the things I want to flag as well, of course, as I, I mentioned at the beginning, is that this is a program, the RSA program, that lasts until this Friday. And next up in the program are more parallel sessions, including a number of special sessions um, from our festival partners on student and early career session and what's next after PhD and noir keynote. Um, and both of those are available to, on, are on tomorrow, the 31st of March. Um, and you can view all the sessions, of course, on the RSA Hub, on the mobile app, or on the desktop version. So have a look. There's an awful lot there to, to get your teeth into, and including, of course, this particular session. If you want to relive um, the highlights and uh, have a look again at some of the questions, there's an awful lot of information that we've packed into a very short period of time. And uh, I think it will take a bit of time to reflect and digest it all. I'll certainly look back and, uh, and try to take out some of the key, pack, key points again. Um, and with all that, I wanted to say a huge thank you again to all of you, all of you that have been participating as presenters, as uh, interlocutors, and, uh, um, and, uh, and certainly for all of you who've asked questions, but all those who are listening in as well. So thank you very much, and uh, goodbye.